So, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, today we have a special informal statistics seminar by George Wong, um, who is a member here. So, uh, George attended his um, PhD with uh, Charles Gemme in August 2021 from the University of uh, Illinois Urbana Champaign. And he's a member now, and he's going to uh, give us some lessons from a statistical model statistical say star and also probably discuss some of the recent results on the event horizon telescope so george please take it away uh, thank you Misha. thank you for the introduction uh, i'm very happy to be uh here in front of so many familiar faces um and and people on zoom talking about uh broadly these uh, most recent uh results from the event horizon telescope um so in particular, the Event Horizon Telescope results uh, that uh, kind of come from observations of the galactic center, uh, and these uh, observations were taken in 2017. Uh, I want to preface my talk by saying that if you count up the number of pages in the six plus four papers uh, that were released this past Thursday, you get 376. Um, that includes uh, references and appendices and so on. Uh, but there's absolutely no way that I could ever hope to describe all of the results that are in all of these papers. Um, and so I'm going to instead focus on a particular set of the results. I'm going to talk about the astrophysical modeling that went into interpreting the observations um, and kind of what we learned from the astrophysical modeling uh, and, uh, and, and similar things. Um, in order to kind of motivate why we can do any astrophysical modeling, why we can compare our models to the data, what we should compare against, uh, I will briefly describe what goes into the imaging procedure uh, and some pitfalls. Uh, you know, so if you just look at the image, you, you might get the wrong impression. So I'll hopefully uh, describe. Okay. Um, I, I will describe why, you know, what you can believe in the image or just in broad strokes. Um, and then before I get started, I, I just want to also plug uh, the fact that Leah Medeiros, who is also a member here, will be giving uh, another talk about EHT results in the context of uh, general relativity, tested general relativity. I'm going to you know, stay away from that topic. Of course, happy to talk afterward uh, about all sorts of things. But anyway, there's my plug. OK. so. Here's the outline of, of my talk. So I'm, it's broadly in, in two different parts. Uh, so the first part is kind of what is the EHT, what is the Event Horizon Telescope, uh, both from an instrumentation perspective, uh, but also from an image reconstruction perspective. And, and again, here I'll kind of talk about what it means to take an image of a source that's varying uh, rather quickly um, and you know, what the actual telescope orientations mean and, and what they were for this observation. Um, and then after this uh, introduction, I will go into the details of the astrophysical model which we used. Uh, and uh, so it, that will be in two parts then. So I'll talk briefly about the physics that goes into, into this modeling, uh, and then also into the constraints that we inferred from the data, from the observations, and kind of what we learned from each of the constraints. Um, in my abstract, I also advertise that I would describe what, uh, what will happen in the future. I'm not sure how much time I'll have after going through these first two bullet points. Uh, so right now, my the future slide is just a single slide. Uh, but if we have time or if you want to talk later on, I have another uh, literally 100 slides that, that we can go through. So OK. So uh, what is the Event Horizon Telescope? Uh, hopefully, this is not too uh, jumpy on Zoom. So the Event Horizon Telescope is broadly an attempt uh, to build some kind of instrument, some heterogeneous array, for example, that is capable of observing supermassive black holes at event horizon scale. So we're interested perhaps in the physics that goes on um, very, very close to black holes. And so this movie is just kind of showing as you scan uh, closer and closer to the center of our Milky Way galaxy, um, you see, uh, I probably should restart this movie. Um, you can see there's a whole bunch of dust in the way. Uh, you can also see a whole bunch of gas that's very, very hot, that's emitting radiation. We're looking at different frequencies here. But uh, one of the reasons that I really like this movie is that it kind of gives you a sense of the scale of how small these supermassive black holes are on the sky. Um, so, you know, we're zooming in uh, quite. Uh, should I check the chat? I can check the chat. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's a comment by Jeremy that I should be. Uh, 
involved in skill bar in the movie. Um, okay, well, I did not. That that's a good point. I will. Uh, that that's a very good point. I will uh, give the uh, advice to the people who made the movie. Um, it also looks flipped this way. It may be just to throw it on the screen something, but whatever we see there. So blame the people in these credits, um, <laughs> not me. Is well, I'll also blame me because I chose it. But yeah, is it X-ray? Uh, these are filaments. Um, so you're talking about, oops, I can't pause it, I can't pause it. You're talking about this kind of halfway through. This orange color. So, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so I believe that this is radio emission, but I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know. Um, it's the Meerkat radio image. Yeah. It, it was the one that was published like a few months ago, or, or right? So, kind of, no, no, no. Um, right, anyway, the, the, the point of this movie is just to, to demonstrate that there's, you know, we're zooming in by significant uh, amounts. There is no scale bar, but for kind of heuristic understanding um, of what's going on, we're talking about maybe imaging a donut on the moon. Um, so this is uh, quite small. Um, so how do you actually, how are you able to resolve, what can you do to try and resolve a donut on the moon? Um, well, you need a very, very large telescope. So uh, effectively, there's some limit to the kind of resolution that you can get. It's associated with the wavelengths of light and uh, how large of a receiving area you have. So the larger the receiving area that you have, um, the better your resolution uh, and the uh, smaller the wavelength also, the better your resolution. Um, but there are some practical limits for how large you can actually build a telescope, of course. Uh, and in fact, one of the most reasonable terrestrial limits is just the largest telescope you could build would be the size of the planet. Of course, this is not exactly feasible to build a dish um, that's, um, you know, that covers the entire face of the planet. Uh, but it turns out that what you can do is to put a whole bunch of telescopes all over the planet and connect them. Um, so here's another nice animation that, that I did not make. Um, and it's just showing uh, the eight different observatories that were involved in this 2017 observation. Um, and one of the crucial things that I'll talk about kind of in, in this next upcoming slide is that uh, really what we're interested in here is that having a large resolving area for the telescope, having you know, a large uh, capturing area, which means that we're interested in the separation between uh, the different pairs of telescopes. Um, so I will run that movie again. And I want you to, to kind of, uh, in your mind, track and remember how these red lines, which again show the separation between multiple telescopes, how these red lines evolve over time. And we'll make this a bit more clear, hopefully, on the next slide. But the basic idea here, again, is that as the Earth is turning, the projected distance, uh, so the project projected length of each of these red lines and also the orientation changes. And so what you can do now is, is you can take each of these distances and each of these orientations uh, as the observation goes over the course of, uh, a, of a, a eight hours or, or you know, however long it takes for the Earth to turn. Um, and you can plot them uh, as you see here um, in the right two plots. And so every single point that shows up in each of these plots here on the right um, corresponds to a, a distance, a separation. So that's kind of the radial coordinate on these plots. Um, and then the angular coordinate on the plot corresponds to uh, the overall angular orientation of the baseline, the separation between the two telescopes. Um, OK, so. We're performing VLBI, which means we're trying to understand, we're trying to reconstruct an image, for example, or reconstruct data by measuring different signals that uh, we receive at one telescope versus another telescope. Um, and so this is, in effect, uh, just measuring complex coefficients, uh, complex Fourier coefficients. So this is happening in the Fourier domain. Um, and the first thing that you will notice uh, for these two plots on the right, or one of the first things you will notice, is that there's very, very sparse coverage. So in an ideal world, if you're taking an observation, if you have an image, 
um, and you want to uh, look at this image with VLBI, what you would do is you say, okay, I have some image. What would I see in the VLBI domain? I just take the Fourier transform of that image. Um, and then as I sweep my baseline, so as my telescope orientations move, uh, I will measure coefficients in each different part of this for an image. Um, but we can't do that because we don't actually have telescopes all over the Earth. This is kind of the detractor. This is the, um, this is the side effect or consequence of only having a limited number of telescopes all over the Earth. Um, so, so this is problem number one. Problem number one is that the array produces a sparse sample over the Fourier domain. Um, and, and problem number two, and we'll see exactly what I mean by problem. Uh, problem number two is associated with the fact that, you know, even though it looks like we have some maybe semi-reasonable coverage over the Fourier domain, um, as you can see, there are these uh, tracks. I don't know where my cursor is. Okay, whatever. Uh, so every single color, for example, in these two plots on the right, uh, these kind of curves correspond to a whole bunch of separate dots. Um, and the, the, these tracks over time correspond to, uh, again, the rotation of the Earth. So as the Earth is moving, the angular uh, orientation of the baseline and the distance along the baseline changes. Um, and, and as we'll see, this, this becomes a problem because effectively, you, if you have a time-dependent source in the Fourier domain, then you're sampling it very, very sparsely, and you're also sampling different parts of the Fourier domain over time, over the course of your full observation. Uh, so to make that a bit more clear, uh, just for now, focus on the left-hand side, uh, these, these three boxes. Um, there's a fundamental mathematical problem here, which is that if you have incomplete coverage over Fourier space, then the inversion, so taking your VLBI data, um, which again is an, an, a sparse sampling of the Fourier coefficients, taking that data and trying to invert it into an image or into uh, an animation movie, that is not unique. Um, another way to say this is that deconvolution is kind of an ill-posed problem. Um, it's not unique. Uh, and again, this is compounded by the fact that not only are you sparsely sampling uh, the domain uh, in terms of, you know, if you have just a single snapshot, if you look at where the tracks are going, over the course of the eight-hour observation, uh, you're also really, really sparsely sampling it in time. And uh, we will see in, in the future when I get to the astrophysical modeling that uh, we expect the source, so Sag I Star, the Galactic Center, to evolve uh, rather significantly on the maybe 10-minute time scale. And unfortunately, it turns out uh, that just due to the way that the instruments work, uh, every single data point, so every single point in that nice little track diagram is about 10 minutes. So I want to emphasize this point. Um, every single uh, data point that we take with Fourier domain corresponds to maybe a full dynamical time, around the order of a full dynamical time for the source. Um, so that's point one. And then point two that, that's related but different is that as we fill out the Fourier domain, so as we sample, for example, one orientation and then sample another orientation, um, we're seeing completely different in principle realizations of the source. Now, if the source were static, this would be no problem because there would be no changing, there would be no time dependent um, coefficients, but in principle, it doesn't need to be static. Um, I, I wanna now briefly describe what's going on in the right-hand side box, uh, because I think that kind of the features that you see here will be important because they'll show up later and, and they speak to how much you can trust about the image. Um, so I'm gonna very, very quickly walk you through how you might uh, mathematically in your mind try and, and formalize what's going on in VLBI. Uh, so in the top leftmost image, uh, what I'm displaying here is a potential source image or truth image. In other words, suppose that we had you know, infinite resolution and uh, you know, or, or we were actually at the source and we could just see everything uh, perfectly, there are no issues with sparse sampling of anything. Um, suppose that this is what we saw. It's a triangular shaped blob. In fact, it does come from a black hole simulation, but, but that doesn't matter. Suppose, suppose that this is what we saw. Okay, now going from that top left image uh, to the bottom left image, what I've done is I've applied a Fourier transform. So uh, effectively asking the question, showing the amplitudes here of, of the Fourier coefficients, effectively asking the question, okay, suppose now instead of taking an image of that source with infinite resolution, we were able to sample the Fourier domain perfectly. Um, 
And this is what we would see. So there's some kind of a compact source image. It corresponds to some kind of compact lobby image in Fourier domain. Uh, okay, great. So this is what we would be able to do if we had perfect information of everything that's going on. Um, now, again, remember that we're doing our observations in the Fourier domain, and we are, in fact, sparsely sampling the Fourier domain. So you can think of uh, the data that we end up measuring as the multiplication or the product of this Fourier transform of the true source image um, with a whole bunch of delta functions, uh, maybe with some particular normalization, but effectively a whole bunch of delta functions over the Fourier plane, um, where these delta functions take a value, take a non-zero value, wherever we have a sampling point. Um, and so this is the UV coverage in the bottom center. Uh, and then to gain some physical intuition for what this actually does to the observation, you can just take the Fourier transform of that sparse coverage. And you end up with what's called the dirty beam. Um, so uh, this you can kind of think of as if you're looking at a source and there's some aberration in the lens, um, and so you're not seeing a perfect image of the source. Kind of how is the uh, source image power being spread out over space just due to the fact that you have some sparse coverage of the Fourier plane. Um, and so, of course, if you're multiplying things in the Fourier domain, that corresponds to a convolution uh, in the image plane. And so at the end of the day, um, what you actually can reconstruct in terms of the data that you actually have is something like the thing on the right. Um, and this just corresponds to some, again, sparse sampling of the visibility amplitudes in the Fourier domain. That's what you're seeing on the bottom right here. So why did I take two minutes, three minutes describing this. Well, I want you to uh, look at the features of the dirty beam. So in particular, there are all of these kind of blobby things, um, and this will be very important. Uh, so just because we have a sparse sampling of the Fourier domain, uh, that means that in principle, we can introduce these kind of blobby artifacts. Again, the deconvolution process is not unique. Um, you can see this just from, uh, or another way of, of, of thinking about what's going on is, you know, in order to perfectly reproduce the source image, we need complete coverage over the Fourier domain. We don't have that, so there's some missing information. It's not, not unique. Um, and one might uh, worry, for example, depending on your image reconstruction algorithm, one might worry that uh, you would see some of these dirty beam features or, or, or something morphologically that looks very similar to these blobby features show up in your reconstructed image. Um, now, I'm, I'm not going to talk about how actual image reconstruction works. So taking the Fourier domain data, the visibility amplitudes, and turning them into a source image, I'm not going to talk about it um, because uh, one could talk about it for a very long period of time. Um, but the basic, a chat message. Um, but the basic way uh, is the positivity of, of yeah. So in, in fact, um, there's this really nice paper, or I don't know how close this is now. There's this really nice paper, I don't have to it on my so Can you repeat the question? Uh, yeah, so the question is, is the positivity of the intensity useful or is the background too high? Um, so effectively, when you're doing this inverse problem, um, you're, you're sampling four A coefficients, which are in principle uh, complex. Um, and you know that this must correspond, but again, you have some sparse coverage of these complex coefficients. Um, and uh, you're trying to invert the, the coefficients into some image. Um, and one thing that you know about the image is that the image has to be positive. You can't receive a negative number of photons at some uh, location. Um, and so in fact, yes, it, that does cut down on the space of possible things, uh, possible. Okay, I should not have opened the chat on my computer. Well, okay, I'll just look the place. Um, so is it showing up over there? Okay. Uh, so this does cut down on the spot, on the space of, um, possible uh, images that are consistent with the Fourier domain data. Um, so yeah, it, it does help. I mean, it's, it's not, um, if you want a quantitative sense of, of how much it helps, given that you know overall there's some power at zero baseline, I, I don't have that off the top of my head, but it certainly is built in. So the actual image, the way that image reconstruction works, or one of the one of the ways you can do this is with what are called regularizers. Um, so you expect that the image has some certain features. So for example, the image has some compactness, um, uh, meaning that you know there, we, we don't expect, for various reasons, there to be uh, a really, really long extended component 
component, for example, a horizontal bar, a really long bar. Um, and so this is a regularizer. You can write down um, this uh, requirement that there not be a really long bar. You can write that down in terms of math. Um, and then that kind of uh, informs your, your image reconstruction process. And one of the regularizers is that the image needs to be positive. Um, and, and what I was going to say is that there's this really nice paper from, um, I don't remember the first author. I think the second author is Ramesh. Ramesh is either second or, or third author. Um, that kind of works out mathematically what the consequences are of having a positive image uh, in terms of the Fourier coefficients. And it turns out to be this really nice symmetric property in terms of the, the rotations between coefficients. Um, and actually that's very useful for if you want to uh, test imaging algorithms because it tells you how to generate coefficients that correspond exactly to a, a, a searching image state that has a uh, positive semi-definite property. But anyway, yes, um, is this right answer to your question? Okay, so uh, going back to this uh, not explanation of how imaging works, uh, one of the ways you can think of it is effectively saying, okay, I know what my Fourier data looks like, but I don't know what image would have produced this Fourier data. Um, so one way to uh, try and construct a consistent image is the so-called clean algorithm, where you just say, okay, suppose I'm only allowed a point source somewhere in the image. Where can I place that point source that uh, will best explain the data so far? And of course, you won't match everything perfectly, but you place a point source. Um, in the best place, uh, and then you do that again. So uh, you say, okay, now I know that there's a point source somewhere. Um, where can I put another point source, maybe with a different amplitude uh, that will best explain the residual? And you can repeatedly do this over and over and over again. Um, and this is the basic way that imaging algorithms work. Um, some people would probably be mad at me for using the simplification, but I think it's a good intuitive picture because uh, in practice, what it means is that you can end up generating a whole bunch of different images that are consistent in some sense with the data. Okay, so, uh, oh no, it's not gonna work because I have the chat. Okay, okay. So let's look visually at what this process uh, produces for SAG, uh, for SAG ASTAR, for the data from the Galactic Center. Um, so what I'm gonna show you over here on the left is running the imaging algorithm or running an imaging algorithm or a set of imaging algorithms um, on the data. And it turns out that more or less all these images uh, that are kind of drawn in a statistically reasonable way that I'm happy to talk about, but uh, we'll skip over for now. Um, so all these images are in some sense consistent with the data. Um, and you will notice that they are all, uh, or that some of them are, are rather different from others. Now, for comparison, I want to show the same imaging process uh, run on the M87 data. And I would argue um, that there is a, you know, a fair similarity between a whole bunch of different, between the different images uh, in the M87 case. So for example, there's bright spots uh, on the bottom, you know, the exact location of the bright spots maybe is not exactly the same, but overall morphologically, the M87 reconstructions look very similar. The SAG I star reconstructions do not necessarily look very similar. And we can make this a bit more precise by performing clustering. So if you're familiar with, uh, for example, clustering in the machine learning context, um, it's the same idea. Again, you can define this in some mathematical way. For every single image, you compute some summary statistics and you look at some space of all the different images and you say, oh, these images have similar uh, brightness asymmetries or these images have similar whatever. Uh, so you can run these clustering algorithms, and I'm going to show you that now. So we're going to run the clustering algorithms on uh, SAGE star and also on M87. And what's going to happen is we're going to pop out um, representative images for uh, the, the, the uh, images that are representative of the population of consistent reconstructions. Um, and so there's nothing really particularly surprising in, in this animation. Um, that I've shown you here on the bottom. What you're seeing effectively is that for SAGE star, there are different morphological classes of images. So some of them have rings, some of them have hotspots in searching locations. There can be different distributions of uh, kind of intensities across those hotspots. And, and in principle, the hotspots uh, don't even have to have the same number for the SAGE star. Right. Yeah, can I rerun that animation again? Uh, okay, so I assume you're talking about this one. Oh, okay. Um, okay, 
So again, as I was saying, there's nothing particularly surprising here. Um, the clusters for the Sag A star reconstructions look broadly similar, um, but there are certainly differences. And you can contrast this with the clusters for the M87 image, uh, image reconstructions where they all are uh, rather similar. Um, uh, and, and so just to make things a little bit more uh, concrete, what I what has been done here is you again take all those images that I was uh, showing here uh, on the left and group them into a question, I guess. Yeah, again, with big significance to the fact that there are four clusters for each is that chosen by hand or that by clustering algorithm? Um, yeah, that's that's a, that's a very good question. Um, there is some human input that goes into uh, this. Um, in the sense that uh, you need to choose the summary statistics. So, right, so you're clustering on parameters. So you look at every single image, you generate summary statistics. Um, and uh, so, so that's one choice. Another choice is um, at the end of the day, when you uh, look at how these summary statistics are distributed in some kind of um, histogram or scatter plot, uh, you can make different choices about how, how to group things. Um, Given the choices that were made, I think there were, there were minimal choices made, and then you turn the crank, and there are four kind of clear morphological classes. Um, but, but there is some human choice that, that goes into this. So the difference between the two is because uh, uh, it's because of this uh, variation with time, or because it's uh, just uh, not so sparse in M87 case. I think that it's it's both. Um, in the sense of a few slides ago when I was talking about how there are these two different issues with uh, the sampling of the Fourier domain. So, so issue number one is that um, a single data point in the Fourier domain for SAG star, a single data point takes like 10 minutes to do. Um, and over the 10 minute time scale for SAG star, that's a dynamical time. Uh, if you contrast that with M87, a single data point in that plane um, corresponds to uh, one over one thousand of a dynamic time, approximately. Um, so you know, as you take different data points in Fourier domain for M eighty seven, the source is not changing at all. Um, so, so it's it's that. Um, but there's also the fact that uh, you know that there are quite a few nuances in even understanding what one of the images from a cluster looks like. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but I just want to kind of um, motivate that by saying. Again, all of these images from the clusters on the bottom left, and, and so these small images are just averages of the families of, of, of clusters and the families of morphologically similar images. Um, each of these images in some, is in some sense completely consistent with the data. Um, and, and so you know, there must be something going on that, that allows it to be consistent and yet look very different. Were you going to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to say, well, if, you, if you're done with this okay. comment, yeah, I just want to make a little comment to people uh, on Zoom. So if you have a question, please unmute yourself and ask this question. So if you ask, yeah, yeah, please don't write. Like if you have the possibility not to write, yeah, just ask the question because it makes life very complicated, makes you know, <laughs> seminar. Yes. Uh, um, well, all right. Jeremy, do you want to unmute yourself and ask the question? Uh, I can uh, ask. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry, asking too many, but uh, just the question was, uh, do you have redundant visibilities, that is, you know, the same pair of telescopes observing at the same time of day, but on different days. So you can um, you'd sort of yeah. directly measure the amount by which the visibility on that baseline is changing. Yeah, so that's that's a very good question. So, I mean, I guess it depends on how, uh, you know, what your metric for redundant is. Um, so I would say uh, in astrophysics where pi squared is G is 10. Yes, certainly. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're certainly measuring the same points in um, Fourier space uh, along different days. And you can see this on, on the right two plots here. So this is, I think, April 6th and April 7th. I can't see on my screen because of the chat. Um, yeah, okay. So it's April 6th and April 7th. Um, and in fact, you know, there's a, a fair amount of overlap between the different days, uh, the same points. But yeah, we certainly have that. Um, but I, I, gotta, I do want to emphasize that every single data point here corresponds to a kind of like full average of a dynamical time for Sag A star, um, where uh, again, a dynamical time, I'm measuring that as 
uh, the orbital time scale at the ISS scale for a non-spinning black hole. So, you know, modify as, as, as you want to. Um, but that means, you know, there, there's different kinds of, of variability. So there's some intra-data point variability that's going on here. And then, of course, there's some variability over the time scale of, you know, taking different data points, but over the same eight-hour period. And then there's some, in principle, could be totally different variability associated with the 24-hour time scale. Um, so, uh, yes, you certainly learn information by sampling the same visibilities uh, on, on different days, uh, but it's... Uh, it's complicated, um, exactly. Oh, so what not all of the, so, so in that plot, what is the visibility that corresponds to the ISCO? In other words, uh, the inner part is of a bigger scale that maybe takes longer to vary. Yeah, okay, that's a really great question. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I don't know, uh, that I should totally, know the answer. Well, all right, so 50 micro arc seconds, uh, 25 micro arc seconds. So the ISCO is like maybe um, uh, for reasonable estimates, maybe like three to 10 RG. So something like uh, 15 to, I mean, so I guess it's, it's pretty far up. Um, but also it's not like, right, one single data point in here corresponds to um, a, a single location in the of course, okay. the, the lower things are like some sort of average over a bigger region. Right? Yeah, and, and in fact, if you were to longer to vary, totally. So if you were to make a plot, for example, of some uh, amplitude of variability on this, um, there is certainly structure in it, um, and it, it actually does not exactly correspond to what you might naively expect. So you can certainly have some variability on. Uh, relatively short time scales, even at zero baseline, um, but, okay, um, right, uh, okay, so, right, um, again, each of the clusters in the bottom left is completely consistent with the data, but it looks different, um, and, and, and now I want to make the point that, uh, that is the consequence of the fact that um, the different data points in the Fourier domain can be taken hours apart from each other. So again, a dynamical time is like 10 minutes. So if you have something that's taken, uh, you know, two hours, uh, the observations that are taken two hours apart, that's probably <laughs> divide wrong in my head now. Um, but you know, on the order of, of 10 overall dynamical time evolutions. Um, so. Um, in practice, what this means is that in the image that you reconstruct, even for, you know, within a single cluster, you should not necessarily trust the location of these blobs. Um, and, and this corresponds in part to that dirty beam that I was talking about before, but there are a whole bunch of other consequences that, that, that uh, result in this or, or, or that produce this effect. Uh, and one of the ways that you can see this uh, particularly clearly, if, if you don't believe me that sometimes the blobs are fake, is just to take a, a very high resolution computer simulated black hole movie. So in that plot that I showed with the two rows of three, um, we're taking the movie, this GRMHD movie of a black hole accretion flow, what does it look like? Uh, and we're running it through the full pipeline. So pretending that it's the truth, making a Fourier transform form of it, multiplying it by some time dependent sampling of, of the Fourier domain and then doing image reconstruction. Um, and what you'll see is that uh, in, in the bottom panel, the third from the left, the one that's labeled reconstructed, um, there appears to be a bright spot that's kind of at the bottom, um, maybe at like 530. Uh, and then another one that's maybe at two o'clock, one, one or two o'clock. Um, neither of those really correspond to a particular instance time from the movie. And this is just corresponding to the fact that uh, you're taking observations at different parts of the Fourier domain at very different times. So effectively, you're getting information about the small scale or large scale or whatever spatial structure in one orientation at one time. And then you wait tens, dozens of dynamical times. Um, and then you take another average image in some sense, because every data point is an average image. And you measure the spatial structure in that average image along a different orientation. Uh, and then you take all the data together and you try and reconstruct a single image from it. Now, this is a completely well-defined statistical thing to do. We can understand it. Um, but it means that this average image in some sense that we construct 
is perhaps misleading. You shouldn't believe what all of these different features are. You shouldn't believe that, for example, the fact that there's a bright blob up in the top and you know it's brighter than the blob at the bottom. You shouldn't necessarily believe that um, because there might not be a blob there at all. Um, and even if there, even if it is consistent, even if the the you know cluster average is consistent with some snapshot, there are other cluster averages that are also equally consistent with data. So you might not see that blob. Okay. Does this saturate at some point, or uh, for example, if we continue to observe it, this image change? Um, which one? Yeah. So that, that's that's a good question. I think that uh, the. It depends on what your source is doing. So I, I and and also kind of like the cadence of your observation. But if you assume if you assume that the source is stationary, um, and you assume that you've taken many many observations, um, I, I I believe that it converges to something. Um, what it converges to will be a function of the actual data that that that. You, you took, right? So, so what the truth is, um, also what your regularizers are, so what assumptions you make, um, and also what kind of your convolutional kernel is, so your imaging reconstruction, but it does converge to, to something. Um, does it converge to the true average image? Not necessarily. Um, okay, right. So uh, I've now taken uh, 36 minutes um, <laughs> to tell you about the images. So I'll try and I guess blitz through the astrophysical. Um, stuff. I was, I was concerned about this, but what I want you to take away from, from this kind of introductory uh, segment is that imaging is hard because there are multiple timescales. There's one timescale, a dynamical timescale associated with, you know, the, the, the source can change drastically. And that produces data for a single data point. Um, and then as you try and reconstruct images, you're getting information about different orientations in the images, different uh, baselines over very much longer time scales. So it will be very important to identify robust features in the data uh, in order to actually make some kind of comparison to your models. Um, and I'll talk about what those robust features that we chose were um, in a bit, um, but I'm going to very, very quickly uh, uh, now motivate our astrophysical models of the source. Um, so this is part two of, of the talk. Okay, so I wanna start with uh, you know your, your physics 101 or, or uh, your physics 101 after you've taken radiative processes course um, and say what is the, the the most naive model that you can write down you want to explain uh, that there's some bright source of emission at the galactic center so what can you write about it well okay so we know that there's bright emission uh, that we see we can measure the overall flux density effectively we can measure the number of photons over a certain frequency range that we're receiving um, we also know something about the mass of the source. So we're going to assume that there's maybe a black hole there, um, or at the very least a, a very large object. We know what its mass is um, for measurements of stellar dynamics, for example. And we know approximately the distance between us uh, and the source. OK, so what can you do with that information? Well, you can, of course, first write down some characteristic scales for the source um, by just doing gm over c squared. You know the mass of the source, gm over c squared. This turns out to be uh, apparently 6.1 times 10 to the 11 centimeters. Um, you can also construct a characteristic time for the source um, by dividing RG uh, by C. Uh, that gives you about 20 seconds. So earlier when I said that the uh, kind of characteristic time for uh, the dynamical time for the source to evolve was about 10 minutes, uh, I was taking this 20 second period and multiplying it by 30, which is about the orbital time at a reasonable radius. Um, okay, so, so you know this, this is just from the mass. If you assume that uh, the gas, you know, so there's some something doing the emission. So let's call it gas, um, or in particular some uh, electron and, and maybe ion component. If you assume that the gas is approximately virialized, um, and you build in some model for the plasma physics that allows you to have subvirial electrons, blah 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 blah, uh, you can estimate what the temperature of the emitting material, what the temperature of the leptons, the electrons, has to be. Um, and in units of MAC squared, which is a convenient unit to use, uh, this turns out to be approximately 10, which is a spherical estimate. Um, if you prefer Kelvin, uh, this is something like uh, order 20 billion Kelvin. Um, and so if you have these three numbers now, if you have some characteristic radius for the source, uh, and you just assume that there's some ball of matter, maybe you know three to five to seven, whatever, it's kind of... Uh, it's a model choice. 
some ball of matter. It's approximately the size, you know, I had the radius approximately uh, the characteristic radius, uh, and it's full of electrons that have this temperature. So what do, we, what do I mean by temperature? Again, they're moving at some speed. Uh, and we assume that there's some magnetic field strength, and again, that there's some number density of these electrons. Then uh, you can write down uh, some set of nonlinear equations that will allow you to estimate, given some number density and given some magnetic field strength, what is the total number of photons you would expect this ball of electrons to produce um, at your 230 gigahertz uh, operational frequency? Of course, you can do this at other frequencies um, with some limits. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that in the interest of time. But again, this is a simple model that you can write down. You know approximately what the temperature is. You know approximately uh, what the characteristic size of the source is. You solve this, uh, and you get that there are approximately a million uh, particles per cubic centimeter. Um, and that the magnetic field strength is approximately 30 Gauss. Um, now, you will notice that I did not say how the electrons are actually doing the emission. Um, in order to come up with this estimate for the emissivity, you have to prescribe some model for the emission. Um, at the end of the day, you can check whether the model that you prescribed is consistent with uh, the numbers that you plugged in. It turns out that it is. And what we find is that we expect uh, most of the emission to be produced by the synchrotron process. And so just as a reminder about what the synchrotron process is, suppose you have some magnetic field and you have some charged particles and some leptons uh, and they're moving uh, in this region with magnetic field. Uh, so you, know, you write down your Lorentz force law that you learned uh, a very long time ago and, and you see that the particles will end up, uh, the particles will end up uh, rotating around the magnetic field lines, uh, orbiting around the magnetic field lines. Uh, and because of the orbiting, they're following uh, semicircular orbits. Um, and so therefore they're feeling some acceleration, accelerating leptons radiate energy, um, and, and you end up with the synchrotron process. Okay, so this is a really simple model for the source. Uh, and it allows you to gain some kind of intuition for what's going on. And it allows you to establish probably synchrotron radiation that matters. Um, but uh, there's you know, something wrong with the source if you try and learn astrophysically what's going on. First of all, a uniform ball in flat space will not look like what we just saw will not look like a ring. Uh, so the image uh, infers some source geometry. And also, a uniform ball in space will not produce any source variability. Um, so you need to kind of uh, build on to uh, this, this simple toy model. Um, and so the way that we choose to do this uh, for the EHT modeling efforts is through a uh, numerical simulation procedure where um, we solve the equations of GRMHD. So what does that mean? It means that we uh, assume something about the distribution of particles. Um, so we assume, for example, that the particles are thermal uh, with, with caveats. Uh, and then we write down conservation laws. So you, know, you can't create or destroy electrons uh, in our models. Um, it's conservation of particle number, uh, density, also conservation of stress energy. Um, we care about magnetic fields, maybe. So you write down Maxwell's equations. You, you build in some constraints. And you can run a fluid simulation. So you're effectively writing out a set of conservation laws, um, and you start with some initial configuration for your electrons um, and maybe your, your magnetic field, and you allow it to evolve under these conservation laws. This is a GRMHD simulation. Um, there are two inputs into the GRMHD simulation, which are the, uh, the spin of the black hole. Um, so the, the black hole can have different angular momenta. It turns out that this affects the overall results. Um, there's also, in principle, the configuration of the magnetic field. So is the magnetic field very strong or is it very weak? Um, is it kind of ordered in certain senses or, or in other senses? Of course, there are other parameters, uh, but this is broadly what you uh, should visualize in your mind. Um, GRMHD simulations then output a time series of the fluid over time, obviously time series over time, um, a description of the, of the fluid over time. Uh, where the description of the fluid gives you the local density at every single point, so the density of the particles, the internal energy, uh, the velocity structure of the magnetic field. Um, and then you take this uh, fluid description, the, the, this time series, you can plug it into GR ray tracing, where you then say, okay, I think that the synchrotron process matters because of my earlier back of the envelope estimates. Um, synchrotron matters. Therefore, we can say if I know what the local density of number or number density of electrons is, and I know what their temperature is, I can compute their emissivity. It's uh, in principle anisotropic. Uh, you can then trace all the photons that you emit through space, uh, and then at the end of the day, uh, end up with some 
Black Hole movie. I will uh, very briefly describe um, this uh, B field configuration parameter, um, because in particular, because uh, see, I asked about it earlier. Um, uh, so very briefly, I, again, I said that there were two inputs into the GRMHD simulation, one being the angular momentum, uh, the other being the relative strengths of the magnetic field. Um, I will just point out that the relative strengths of the magnetic field qualitatively divides your evolution solutions into two different states, um, states where the magnetic field is very strong, mad, uh, in states where the magnetic field is if not particularly dynamically important, saying uh, standard normal evolution. Um, and if you care, the way that you should uh, internalize this, this dichotomy is that if you look at what's going on in the midplane of the accretion, so you have a maybe a whole bunch of gas that's falling onto a black hole, um, in the mad state, magnetic fields are very, very strong. It can actually stop the inward flow of uh, gas in certain directions magnetically arrested. And so what you see in the left-hand movie is that there are large regions of space that are completely evacuated. Um, and so there's strong magnetic fields that are resisting the inflow motion. This contrasts again with the same case where there are still magnetic fields, but they're not strong enough to completely, completely uh, stop the inward flow of uh, Okay. So this is the kind of mad versus sane dichotomy. Of course, you could try and be more detailed in, in understanding the structure, um, but, but we won't. Okay. Um, Going over to the GR ray tracing, so I've kind of uh, hidden this word thermodynamics in this box. Uh, the plus means that it's an input to the ray tracing. Um, so, so what does this mean? Well, as I said on the previous slide, the evolution equations uh, track the total internal energy of the fluid, um, which means that if you are trying to understand the synchrotron emissivity, um, which comes from the electrons, you need to somehow translate from the total internal energy of the fluid into your electron distribution function. So again, in the synchrotron process, you have magnetic field lines with some orientation. Um, electrons are, are kind of swinging around the magnetic field lines um, and uh, you know, radiating as they do this. But in principle, different electrons can have different speeds. So you have a full distribution function of your electrons. Um, and in order to know what the total emissivity is so over um, over this entire distribution of, of electrons, you need to know the details of how to translate the total internal energy into, into the distribution function of the electrons. Um, and, and so I'm going to briefly motivate uh, the fact that, uh, maybe motivate is a strong word, I'm going to briefly state um, that there are different ways to do this translation. So um, depending on what you believe about how the particles interact, right? So at the end of the day, you have a whole bunch of electrons and ions, and they are, you know, probably not directly colliding with each other, but, you know, there are kinetic effects and so on. Um, depending on what you believe, you can end up with different distribution functions for your electrons. Um, and the point is that this is a model uncertainty. So uh, in principle, if you want to test your full model space, you have to look at different parameterizations for translating the internal energy, um, which is a single number, that's defined over all of space and, and time around the black hole, translating that into a local uh, kind of how many electrons do we have traveling at this speed. Uh, again, at every point, you can assume that the particles are thermal. This is so-called maxwell eubner um, or you can assume that there's some thermal core and it kind of asymptotes off into a power law. Um, and there are different ways to do this, kappa uh, and versus various different power law prescriptions. Um, anyway, once you've made this choice, <coughs> You can then process your GRMHD simulations um, and ask, OK, so locally, how much emission is there going to be? This is what you're seeing in these uh, rotating uh, animations. Uh, MAD models and SANE models can produce very different emission morphologies. You compute the emission at every single point in space. Uh, you track the emission throughout space, and then you produce an image at the end of the day, or maybe uh, a spectrum. OK, so example model outputs. Um, on the left, let's see. Right. On the left, what I'm showing you is uh, a set of images that are again produced from this exact process. So you run a, a fluid simulation. Um, you get the fluid state, which tells you the internal energy. You make some choices about how to translate that internal energy into a distribution function of electrons. Uh, you also make some choices about the orientation at which you want to view uh, your black hole. Are you looking straight down? Are you looking from the side? So on and so on. Um, and then you make some choice about what observing frequency you want, uh, and then you can produce the image. And you see morphologically the images can look rather different. 
Uh, so each column here uh, corresponds to a different model. It turns out these models are reasonable fits for the data. That's how they were selected. Um, but still, they're morphologically rather different. Uh, you see differences in the 86 gigahertz uh, image versus the 230 gigahertz image. Um, broadly, 86 gigahertz uh, is harder to see through, um, which means that it, it ends up looking bigger. Um, you can also, of course, uh, kind of compute these images versus frequency of a full scan. Um, and at, as you reach a certain point, uh, Compton processes start to matter. So you have some initial distribution of, of photons that are produced just from the space synchrotron process. Um, and the photons travel through space and maybe inverse Compton scatter with electrons that are in the gas. They're hot enough um, and uh, you know, gain energy inverse Compton scatter. And so you get these bumps. So every single model in principle produces a whole bunch of images and, and an SED, the spectral energy density. Okay, now we did this for a large number of uh, different models and I kind of just wanted to use this animation as a kind of shock and awe thing. Um, I figured I would tally up uh, what we actually did. Um, so we ran these models with six different fluid evolution codes, um, two different imaging codes, uh, only one Monte Carlo code to produce spectra. Um, but the reason I'm, I'm pointing out this six and two, uh, also with three for validation, is that we were able to actually test the assumptions or you know, the approximations that went into each of these fluid codes, kind of test the spread um, of, of numerical uncertainty. Uh, we also looked at four different accretion states. So I talked about mad and sane, um, but in principle, you can have semi-mad states uh, that correspond to, for example, um, don't have, have a, a steady disk accretion. So if there's a, a disk that's maybe tilted with respect to the black hole, um, since I have eight minutes, I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, also, wind-fed models. So if you, if you don't have a disk at all, and then you're just throwing gas on uh, the black hole from stars, uh, nearby stars, we tested eight different uh, black hole annual momentum, different prescriptions for the fluid, um, seven uh, different thermal electron distribution prescriptions, six different non-thermal ones, uh, and ions over inclinations. Uh, producing about 2 million times 3 images um, and about 1.3 million spectra. Um, and so this corresponds to 50 terabytes of images uh, and spectra um, and petabytes of fluid simulations. Um, so uh, I, I think that's a lot. Um, OK, finally, <laughs> get to the constraints. Um, in effect, uh, we look at 11 separate constraints uh, from the EHT data. Again, you will recall that I said we want to look for robust features. Um, so we're not going to care about the exact position angle of, of the different blobs. We're not going to care about the number of blobs. Um, but these are the 11 uh, robust features that we chose. Uh, I will now very, very briefly go through each of these different features. Um, but they can be broadly uh, grouped into three different classes. So data that arrived directly from the EHD observations, um, data that, oh, well, that should say not derived from EHD data, I'm sorry, uh, in, in the second class. So not derived from EHD data, uh, but derived from simultaneous observations. So observations took place at the same time as the EHD observations, um, and then also variability constraints. And so there are variability constraints that come from uh, image integrated uh, uh, data, so for example, the ALMA, um, and also structural variability. Okay, so I'm just gonna now blitz through each of these constraints um, tell you what we learned from each of them, hopefully rather quickly. So the first uh, constraint in this list is, is the 230 gigahertz size. Um, and we call this the pre-imaging size because uh, we want to somehow measure the overall extent of the emission um, that we see in the image without relying on assumptions about this image reconstruction procedure. So what can we learn uh, purely from the data without building in any extra assumptions about this uh, deconvolution procedure? Um, and so it turns out one of the ways you can do this is kind of measure the slope or, or the second derivative of the slope of the Fourier amplitudes at zero baseline. So the second moment of the image corresponds directly to the kind of second derivative near the origin in Fourier space. Um, and graphically, um, uh, what this does is kind of identifies uh, kind of the region of, well, it's the second moment. Um, we all know that. We all know what that is. Um, so graphically, what I'm showing you here in the two different images is four different snapshots. Uh, what is the second moment inferred image size? Uh, that's the white circle. Um, and the constraint is very simple. Does it lie within 
these, uh, th these two green circles, which come directly from the EHG data. Um, turns out this is a very, very permissive constraint, but one you want to apply nonetheless. 98% of our uh, 6 million or so uh, images pass this constraint, I guess 1.8 million. Uh, anyway. um, okay. Another constraint is the so-called visibility amplitude morphology. Um, and uh, so again, remember that after purely in the data domain, uh, you take the truth image with the Fourier transform, uh, and then you multiply that by your, your sparse sampling, and you get just some numbers that correspond to the delta functions that you apply into uh, your Fourier data. Uh, and you can plot what these numbers are, for example, as a function of radial coordinate in uh, the Fourier domain. And you can then just ask, as a function of radial coordinate, does the image reproduce uh, amplitudes that are approximately consistent? Um, and the two constraints here are, uh, does the location of the first null match? So what you're seeing here is uh, on, on the bottom two panels of the right, you see these two gray regions. Um, so the leftmost gray region is just a uh, radial coordinate in the Fourier space um, and is the first place where the uh, Fourier transform amplitudes get very small, does it lie within that gray band? Um, and then the other constraint that you apply here is, are the amplitudes at long baselines consistent? In other words, do you have a sufficiently low or high, but in this case low, um, amount of energy or, or power at long baselines, which again corresponds to small features? Um, this is a somewhat uh, more informative constraint in that only 80% of the models pass. Um, and I will say that the models that don't pass generally tend to correspond to models where you're looking at things edge on. Um, so again, purely from EHT data, we haven't built in anything else. We haven't built in imaging assumptions, for example. We can say that uh, edge on models are, are, are somewhat disfavored. Uh, this is uh, just showing you pictorially what I mean by uh, Fallon. OK. Uh, and then the final set of constraints that we apply from the EHT only data are kind of geometric constraints. Um, so again, this doesn't necessarily rely on image reconstruction, um, but uh, you can think of it in your mind if you want to as kind of reading off image parameters. Um, so you build some geometric model for what an image could look like. For example, uh, to, to first order, you can, or maybe to second order, you can think of, a, of the image as some circle with some distribution of flux around the circle. Um, so that circle uh, has some overall diameter. The distribution of flux um, has some position angle, for example, and some width. Um, so uh, that's kind of like three different parameters. It's not exactly what we do here. Um, again, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the details. I'm happy to talk to you later on. Um, but then you ask, are these three model parameters consistent with the data? Uh, since we use the geometric model, you can just fit the geometric model directly to the data. So you could produce an image, uh, which would be subject to these imaging, and then fit the image. But alternatively, you can just fit the geometric model directly to the VLBI data. Um, so is the ring diameter consistent? 54% pass. Is the asymmetry consistent? The position angle, for example, uh, not exactly that, but um, consistent, 91% uh, pass. And then you can ask, is the ring width distribution consistent? And this turns out to be the most constraining um, uh, parameter from, from the EHT alone, uh, only data, not including variability. Um, and uh, this physically just corresponds to, it turns out um, kind of what the inclination, again, that you're looking at the sources. So I said for the VA morphology, the constraints on the last slide, um, kind of disfavored looking edge on, this is a, a similar kind of disfavoring. Um, right. Uh, Okay, very simple. You can ask, is the flux consistent um, at multiple different frequencies? So this is now a non-EHT constraint. Simultaneous observations say how much energy we receive at different frequencies. Um, of course, we don't know that our models include all the physics. Uh, so it's possible that there are different energy energization mechanisms uh, that result in uh, more energy being produced in the x-rays, for example. Um, so the constraints that we apply are just uh, do our models produce more than what is observed? And if so, we cut on them. Um, okay, so here's the summary so far of, of the results. Um, applying all of those constraints that I gave so far, so nine of the 11, um, it's actually pretty constraining. Um, 
So, but, but still some remain. And I would be remiss not to point out that I, I think that this is kind of a remarkable achievement uh, for numerical uh, GRMHD simulations of sources. Um, this certainly did not need to be this way. There are nine constraints that are, are quite uh, restrictive and some models are perfectly consistent with all these constraints. Um, what do we learn from this? Well, the persistent models tend to be um, MADS, so this high magnetization state um, with uh, low inclination, so not looking at things edge on, um, and tend to have cool electrons. So again, remember I said that there was some freedom in choosing how to assign the electron distribution function based on thermal energy. Um, so this is a, a kind of uh, uh, the, the answer to that question. Um, strongly disfavored models include single temperature fluids. Um, so this is, again, just a question of the distribution function of the electrons. Um, looking at things as John is disfavored um, and models where the accretion flow is, is going counter to the black hole uh, in your mind are, are also disfavored. Um, okay, this is uh, in <laughs> negative one minutes that I have left. I actually think one of the most interesting results from the PhD. <clears throat> um, so I will uh, describe it very briefly, pretty much um, if you try and uh, measure the overall variability in the light curve for any of the GRMHD models. So what do I mean by the overall variability? I mean, write down a light curve, it's, it's a time series, um, and break up that time series into windows and measure in each window, measure the overall uh, kind of spread, the variations, and divide that spread by, by the mean in that window. If you look at that distribution, the distribution of these modulation indices, um, for any GRMHD model. So this includes tilted simulations, this includes wind-fed simulations, MAD, SANE, and so on. Um, these distributions tend to be categorically more variable than the observed data, historically. Um, uh, this, this question you mentioned that you are looking, when you look at different visibilities, and you're comparing at different times also different things. How is this taken into account? Yeah, so this is an overall, uh, this is the overall light curve, the overall power in the image, which is something like measured from the zero baseline. So you can do this just with ALMA. So this is not the HD. Uh, this particular, these plots that I'm showing are not EHD. I mean, it was an EHD observation because it was at ALMA and ALMA was participating, but it's not the EHD array. That's right. Um, so, so, I, again, I just want to emphasize very quickly that I think this is an incredibly interesting result um, because for all of the other constraints, there was some kind of spread. So the models, you, you know, the data that we observed were consistent with some of the models. Um, and that is certainly still the case here. So the data are still consistent. Uh, the variability data are still consistent with some of the models, but there's a strong bias for all of our models um, to be more variable than the, the observational data. Um, so uh, it turns out if, if you build in the constraints that you get from this variability uh, and you kind of multiply them in some Boolean sense or you end them in some Boolean sense with the constraints from the nine previous uh, comparisons, you find that, that no models work. Um, I don't think this is particularly concerning um, because 11 constraints is, is large. What I do think is concerning or perhaps not concerning but exciting is the fact that there's evidently some physics that's, that's missing. Um, in our simulations, or at least this is one way to interpret it, and this is the way I choose to interpret it. There's some physics that's missing in, in the variability because we're categorically producing models that are, are, are too variable. Um, so the same plot out there doesn't really look so bad. Which are the histograms that I should be comparing? Yeah, so you should be comparing um, the, the, the gray filled histogram, which is the, the data. Um, with uh, samples of distributions drawn from the uh, black models, uh, so from from the black outlined histogram. Um, so so. Why is it not just fine? It looks fine. I don't know. So you can perform uh, so the Kolmogorov Smirnov test, K KS test, um, and the likelihood is is, is very low. Um, and the same, the same case looks higher, but earlier said in yes. that. So why? Right. So, so same model. So right. So this is just a, a different class of comparison, and I, I completely agree. That's why I think it's interesting, right? Uh, if you don't include the variability, 
which we have reasons to believe that simulations don't reproduce variability correctly. Um, if you don't include the variability, you see that MAD models are our favorite. Um, it turns out, perhaps unsurprisingly, that SANE models are less variable than MAD models. This is, again, perhaps unsurprising because, uh, as we saw in those animations, SANE models are our smooth. Um, but it's, it's, they're not, in general, consistent. I mean, so, so Matthias, I, I do agree with you that there are, you know, sayings look better, and there are certainly some sayings that are consistent with the data. That, that, that is certainly the case. But statistically, overall, if you draw a random same model, there's low likelihood to be actually consistent with the data in the KS test. Um, boy. Um, should, I, should I have the overlap fraction, though, to, to follow Matthias' question? The overlap fraction between gray and black, does that not give you the percent of models that pass, which by I looks like much more than 10 percent. Yeah. Um, the, the issue with this is that the way that the, right, so, so, so the, you're drawing a distribution from the black outlined histogram. Okay. So that's the sum of all the different distributions. You're drawing a distribution from that distribution. Yes. Um, Does this include the wind fed models? Yep. Which one they? Uh, oh, sorry. These plots do not include the wind fed models. Um, but I will say, if you do this comparison for the wind fed models, they are also too variable. Well, we find that they're not too variable. That's a different measure, right? So this is a measure. It's very hard to see what's on your axis. What's on the axis, actually? Sorry? What's on the axis? Uh, so the x axis here is this modulation index, mm -hmm. which is the, uh, right? So. And then the y-axis is just a count. It's, it's a histogram. So the, the difference between this measurement and what you did. So there's another variability comparison that we do, which is kind of the intra baseline variability um, at four giga lambda, and it is consistent, which is consistent with your results. This is effectively asking what the normalization, whether the normalizations of the models are consistent. But the problem with normalization of the models is that uh, if you look at his, if you historically look at different pieces of the data. You'll see that the shape, uh, we're talking about structure functions, the shapes are basically the same. I mean, right, right, so that's, you have to cut at some point. Because, right, right, right. Uh, but the amplitude always variable. And so, your samples for higher cadence data comes from different places. They're not as well sampled as the rest of the data. So in principle, it's a wonderful way to you know, compare the, um, like the, the total variability, the amplitude of variability. But the problem is that the current uh, amount of observations we have, we just don't have big enough samples, so it's not very meaningful. I, I well, okay, so, so I mean, I can make a statistical statement, which is that there are obviously, as you're saying, right, there are multiple ways that you can choose to down select from all historical data. Um, and so, for example, one thing, one way you could do this comparison is just Instead of using historical data, you could just pull um, these modulations, the, the, the distribution from EHT simultaneous observations um, and look at the distribution and produce a test. I, I, no, I'm just saying, I'll, I'll look at your data. You, you have some amplitude. Yes. You forget the sample. You look at the different sample, and the shape is the same. I, I, I said the amplitude is I, the same. I, I, I don't, we don't have enough samples to come to figure out what's the actual observed so values are. So, so this, I, it's we probably should take it out. Yeah. Okay. Outside. Okay. Well, but, sure. uh, we'll take it. Uh, um, okay. So, in any case, um, I believe that this is my last slide, despite the fact that it says uh, thirty-two. Um, so, so what have we done and what have we learned? Uh, so, in, from the astrophysical context, uh, we've compared millions of different uh, simulations to these 11 different constraints, uh, found that the EHT data itself is a key constraint. So again, the EHT data itself, not including the, these other frequencies uh, and so on, um, tells you that uh, you're not looking at things at John um, uh, and, and has some preference for MAD versus SANE, for example. Um, also electron temperature, um, including other constraints, uh, makes the, uh, narrows down the parameter space even more, which is perhaps unsurprising. Um, and including variability, and, and we can discuss uh, this, this more, but if you include variability and, and, and if, you, um, if you use the modulation index as a statistically reasonable way to make this comparison, which uh, 
I, I will just quickly follow up and say that uh, this result here from this slide does not depend on how you downsample your data. So the, the normal is it, you can choose from different periods, you can choose from different instruments, it, it produces the same cut. Um, most models are too variable. Um, now here's my, my caution. Um, the best bet models are with respect to our prior. So I said in, in five and six, uh, I've, I've identified certain models as uh, favored and certain models as disfavored. Um, but of course, even though we looked at millions of different images, we did not look at all the different possible feeding models. We did not look at all the different possible electron temperature distributions, um, assignment schemes. Um, we didn't include all of the different physics you could. So you could include um, viscosity and, and conduction and so on. This could change things. So, you know, you, you should not, I, I think, and this is also the opinion espoused by uh, the astrophysical paper, um, you should not believe too strongly in the precise quantitative results that you might infer from paper five. Um, certainly the trends are true. Um, so as you go to, you know, uh, higher inclination, as you go to look at things edge on, um, the morphology starts to disagree with, with the image in a pretty significant way. Um, but the exact inclination cut, maybe don't believe. Um, but, uh, right, so, so we believe the trends generally. Um, don't take this as a posterior that's uh, particularly meaningful because the prior is, is quite sparse. Um, as we include more physics in the future, things could change. Future is exciting. I've gone 12 minutes over. I'm very sorry. Um, I won't read through this slide. Um, I'd be remiss not to uh, point out that you know, this was uh, 300 people. This is the last time we, we met as a group in person, uh, unfortunately, in 2019. But there's an upcoming meeting in, Gra in Granada, so that's, that's uh, exciting. Um, thank you for your time, and I'll just leave this with uh, what's next in the future. And I'm very sorry for that. Thank you, George. Do we have a question? Yes. Um, just a quick question. Do we learn anything from each the um, accretion scenario? What do you mean by accretion scenario? So you mentioned that it could be accretion disk or just a passing star. Yeah. Um, I would say that our model space is not sufficiently large to learn anything definitive. I mean, there are models that are uh, not wind-fed that are consistent with the constraints. Um, wind-fed models do better in some respects, um, in, in many respects, and just from a physical product perspective, it's much more likely. But I would say, uh, you know, you shouldn't necessarily believe uh, any, you shouldn't infer any, any tight constraints. Yeah. So, so you see this difference is when you model, uh, so this model you show that is particularly for a particular uh, black hole is just a very general. Um, right, so the ones that I showed are general, but we also considered these four different classes, right? So some of them are, are more particular. So for example, the wind-fed models, right? So from passing stars, um, we considered two uh, compared to, you know, hundreds uh, of the other ones, which is why I say you shouldn't trust it because the prior is very naive. Um, but I mean, it's consistent. So, I mean, we learned that it's consistent. We learned that many things are consistent. I, I would be uh, hesitant to infer tighter constraints than that. So you mentioned that each of the exposure was 10 minutes long, yes. and that is set by the least sensitive telescope in the array, right? So you have to get to the sufficient SNR, whereas I would assume that a Jansky level source like Alma wouldn't need 10 minutes to yeah. get a high SNR. Yeah. So would we you know, somehow replace those uh, the smaller mm -hmm. dishes you know, with, uh, at the same baseline or somehow would that drastically improve kind of the variability? If, if you can get that grant, I, I say absolutely, yes, yes, to, to be, to be non-glib. Yeah, ab absolutely. So, um, it, you know, it would, I don't know if it would necessarily improve the variability because I don't know what that means, but it would give us more data with respect to, um, you know, it might make it easier to uh, interpret what an average image means in some sense. Uh, it would also give finer detail, uh, time scale stuff. Uh, I will say, however, that you certainly don't want to start removing instruments from the array because we're already very sparsely sampling. So you do really want to add uh, more sensitivity. Also, th these were 2017 observations. Uh, you know, more observations were taken in 2018, 2021, 2022. The data rates have quadrupled at least, and, and you know, we have Noema involved now, and so on. So, but yeah, so, um, it's also just 
Someone needs to pay to do this. I have another question related to the kind of you uh, you're trying to uh, kind of optimize the. It's not trying to find the best fit model, but trying to see which parameters yes. over a very high dimension of yes. parameter space, which parameters are okay. Yes. So uh, instead of doing a, like a brute force grid grid search, is there like a better way you do like a better informed like an optimization method, high dimensional, can, kind of you know doing like millions of these? Yeah. Searches. So so that's that's definitely the right question. Um, I think that the parameter space is so large that, you know, if I were writing a Monte Carlo algorithm, right, the first thing to do is just to distribute the walkers over the space in, yes. in some way, right? You have 100 or you know, 1,000 walkers, you just throw them into the space. This is what we've done so far. So it's not even like, you know, we're, so yes, this is the right question, but, you know, a GRMHD simulation takes something like, uh, I, I can't multiply quickly in my head, 64 times seven times, 128 core hours to run, um, which is sufficiently large that you know you can't Monte Carlo over the space. You can you can you can try and you know say oh these models are most consistent. Let's explore there. And in fact, we did this to a limited extent. This is the right thing to do, um, but it's just it's a very computationally uh, expensive, challenging problem. I see uh, Chris has yeah. Chris, please uh, unmute yourself and go ahead. Yeah, I just had a question about. A lot of the reconstructed images seem to be eccentric, which you wouldn't see when you're just extracting like M ring parameters, because that kind of assumes a circle. Is okay. there a significance to that? Um, yeah, so I, I, you know, one way that you can trace this question uh, more or less quantitatively, I think, is um, is it one of the robust features in the sense of if you average all the clusters, does it persist? Um, I think the ellipticity is, um, you know, a very consistent feature. Um, one might therefore infer that you're looking at things edge on, but I, I would be hesitant to do this. Uh, the edge on constraint is also inconsistent, or the edge on inference is also inconsistent with morphological constraints. Uh, but in, in terms of just, do you trust that there seems to be uh, different semi-major and semi-minor axes. I think that that is probably robust, but I don't want to make a statistical statement, a quantitative statistical statement about that. Right. Does this answer your question or, or at least respond to your question? Yeah, yeah, that's... Yeah, I guess the way you presented, maybe in the paper is different, I didn't look at the paper, but uh, first, the, 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 the images themselves, you didn't use them in the end for for the and and sec so which makes sense to me because it's an ill-defined problem. I don't even know why you would I mean other than for looking at the images it's fine, but sounds like you should compare what you measure. Yes. But okay, so fine. But then even what you measure, then you decided, oh, these features like the zeros or something, which again is some sort of was this some ad hoc thing or what's the deal? Why can you just compare like a prop? I mean, it looks like you're throwing things away, right? Yeah, so we that's totally are throwing idea. things away. And that's, that's totally true. Um, I will argue that the things we threw, or not the things we threw away, but the things that we keep, are uh, it's reasonable to keep them. So for example, the first zero, this first null, um, one reason that it would be reasonable to keep that is because you can quantitatively measure how much that changes over the course of the observations and compare that, for example, to how much the amplitude of you know, the second peak varies over the course of the observations. And you want to find things that are relatively consistent um, and, and also discriminating. But I, I mean, I, I agree at the end of the day, you know, we wrote down 11 constraints. 11 is certainly smaller than the number of data points that we took. Um, there, there are different choices that, that could have been made. Um, you know, it, it, 11 constraints is, is... And then you multiply them together, one after that also looks well, like... Well, this is why, yeah. And, and so that is completely unjustified. Sorry, sorry. It looks like uh, you have this great observation, and then at the end of the day, you start doing some mumbo-jumbo magic. But maybe... Yeah. It's, Better describe it, or, or, or it's you know it's not like this. Just no, no, no. I, I think I think that's absolutely right. Um, and and 
this is why I think it's important not to read uh, the results as a posterior that tells you something informative about the global posterior, assuming the prior is correct. Um, I, I think that the thing that you have to do with, with all EHT observations, um, or thing that I, I think is right to do, we did this with M87, is to ask if we can associate certain consistent, I, I use the term robust, certain consistent features in the data with uh, model properties. Um, and, and the answer is yes, you can, right? So you can consistently associate you know, this, this ring width distribution number that I, I didn't go into in detail. You can consistently associate that with inclination. And there, that's a completely well-defined statistical process that, that you can um, perform. You can say, what is the likelihood that we measure this particular distribution of ring widths versus position angle over scans and so on? Um, and, and you can say, OK, for all the models, what is the likelihood for the actual observation? What did we actually measure? What was the distribution over time? And compare those to distributions. And that tells you something informative. And, and I do believe that that tells you something informative. Boolean ending them at the end of the day, I, I don't believe you should. I mean, of course, it's a posterior in some sense because you know it, it follows Bayes there, but your prior is completely screwy. So yeah, I don't believe that you should interpret these results. And, and I, I think in the paper, it also says this. You should not interpret these results as, oh, we believe that it's uh, mad, uh, prograde, high spin, you know, low temperature thing. This is our, you know, this is what we believe the source is. We call it the best bet in the sense that it is a model that is completely consistent. But I think that the real science, the real lessons are in trying to uh, connect these robust observable things that you can measure directly from the data to some features of your model. And, and I do think that that is a meaningful thing. Uh, so for example, for M87, the, the, the robust things that we did were identified for all the models that are consistent, the location of the brightness of symmetry tells you something about the spin of the black hole, um, which is somehow connecting an image feature to a physical parameter. Maybe you disagree. I'm happy to. I don't know anything about it. It's just... No, I, I, I do not believe that, that you should, you know, one, trust the blobs in the image. Uh, this is thing number one. And thing number two, I do not believe you should uh, read the results as a particularly informative posterior. Because, because you're Boolean ending, right? There, there's clear correlations between the ring width parameter measurement and the visibility amplitude morphology, and we don't account for that, right? So. Jeremy? Yes, yeah, so I'm just wondering, do the, does the modeling process provide any guidance to future observations? For example, you know, is it valuable to have simultaneous IR and X-ray observations to constrain the electron distribution, or are certain baselines, you know, particularly informative in terms of moving work? So I think that short baselines are particularly informative. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, long baselines always are, but that's hard. Um, and I, I mean, so I'm just going to agree with what you proposed as being important. I do think that simulations uh, tell us this in some sense, because you might ask the question of the simulations that work or of simulations that are close to ones that work. Uh, what are the most discriminating features that you see there? Um, and uh, yeah, so spectrum, for example, I don't think we have a, a firm grasp of um, exactly what is the most interesting observable yet, just because the space is so sparsely sampled. But I mean, yes, they, they do. And I think that what you proposed is, is the right thing to do. So, you know, simultaneous IR observations. Um, so one, uh, you know, if you can see Sag star, if you can observe it while there's a flare or shortly after a flare, um, Maybe that doesn't tell you so much about the models, but it, it's very interesting um, in terms of you know parameter discrimination for the models. You know what what is your reconnection model and your turbulent dissipation model? Okay, I'm. I guess it, yeah, that, that's it. Let's let's okay. stop it here. Thank you, everyone, and uh, thank you.